Hey friends, welcome to our Tech Trainer Chats. Today we're gonna to be talking about public versus private cloud computing, a hotly debated topic out there in the industry. Uh, my name is Bart Castle. I am cloud and AWS expert trainer here at CBT Nuggets, and I'm joined with two times CCIE uh, Cisco expert trainer, Jeff Kish. How you doing, Jeff? Hey, doing great, Bart. Thanks for uh, putting this together, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, cloud computing is a very important set of principles uh, and models out there that offer a lot of opportunities for organizations to fix problems and drive value. And when we look at NIST, they laid out some deployment models like public, private, hybrid, and community cloud. Uh, but what exactly do we know about these? Which model is the best? Uh, maybe we could just start with private, Jeff. What do you, what do you think? How would you define private and uh, what's the big uh, pitch behind it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when we talk about private clouds, it's interesting because a lot of people will describe their own on-premise data centers as private clouds. And the reality is that when we're talking about the features of the cloud, like being able to automatically provision virtual machines and chargeback features and such, those are features that we can deliver to our on-premise data center. But if we're not doing that, then it's not much of a private cloud. Now, when we're talking about the reasons why we might want to deploy into a, high, uh, into a private cloud, one of those reasons would absolutely be data sovereignty. Even in this day and age, we're a little bit leery of other companies managing and controlling our data. And so whether we're talking about company secrets, you know, this trademarks and uh, patents and such, eh, we might not be as comfortable deploying that into a private cloud space or into a public cloud space rather. So we'd want it in the private cloud. Um, we'd have to think about our clients' personal information. You know, if, we're, if we are storing social security numbers or health information, that's information that we need to make sure that if we're going to deploy that into a public cloud, that we've dotted our I's and crossed our T's as far as making sure that they are going to do everything they can to protect that data. Because ultimately, we're responsible. Our organization is the one that's responsible for what happens to the data, even if it's breached in somebody else's cloud. When, when I do a lot of these kinds of designs and conversations, in a lot of cases, it's actually more expensive to run it in the cloud long term. And I always like to say, you know, that, that makes sense because if I'm going to pull up to a hotel and have somebody else park my car, that's valet parking, I shouldn't expect it to be the same cost as me parking it myself. I, I mean, they're providing a service for me that comes at a cost. It's not just a matter of which one costs more in the end. It's also a spending model. So some CEOs and some CFOs, they love to have a monthly recurring service. It doesn't matter how much it costs, but some prefer, hey, you know, if we can do it cheaper and we can just put the money down right now, that's called a capital expenditure or a CapEx spend. Well, then at that point, then it makes sense to stay in the private cloud because we can go out and procure hardware as a one-time purchase and deploy that into our data center. Um, the last thing I'll say very briefly, there are just some services that we need on-prem. We always need DHCP, we always need DNS and some level of directory services. And so deploying that into the cloud or maybe asking your network to handle those for us aren't the best solutions at times. And so when we realize that, okay, well, we're gonna have to have some amount of data center on premise, we're gonna have to have some amount of workload. At that point, we might as well keep some other workloads for the other reasons that we discussed. Now, Bart, I you know that's my take on the private cloud. There's gotta be some, some level of uh, conversation around public cloud and how they, how we can still leverage public cloud in a lot of these cases. What do you think? Uh, sure, yeah, well, I thought those were great examples. Um, whenever I think of private, it's definitely uh, the paradigm of predictability. And um, what do we really know about our workloads and our operating models? Because when we look at the public cloud computing model, one of the key value propositions is offloading work um, kind of the valet scenario you were talking about, we specifically are seeking that out uh, and we wanna get the value that that sort of opportunity provides. On top of that, cloud providers in the public world often have this ability to operate at a global footprint level, uh, you know, with the snap of a set of fingers there. So when I'm looking at an, uh, a potential project that we're creating, we don't know where it's going and we hope that it gets really big, <laughs> then we have a massive capacity planning problem right there in front of us. That's exactly where public cloud providers really excel because they offer enough, more than enough um, opportunity for us to expand our resources and services um, to meet whatever demands and unpredictable uh, changes might come to us. So that global mm -hmm. elastic concept there, if you don't know what you need, then using it in a cloud environment that somebody else owns the asset parts of it as a public provider, whether it be 
AWS or Azure or Google, they're going to be a great fit for that because they can insulate us from the, the operational burden of owning those things when we don't need them. Along those same mm -hmm. lines, another great fit would be experimental proof of concept. You don't even know if you want to buy the service or the tool that you're going for. So if you can go and spin it up in a cloud service provider that's publicly available, um, that gives you kind of that on-demand usage model, that's going to be a great fit. Uh, I can go it, try it out, see what levels I need, what features I need, and throw out the parts I don't. And when I'm done with it, I've released the asset maintenance parts of it back onto the considerable shoulders of our cloud service providers. And that kind of brings mm -hmm. me down to that. That last piece there. Um, the idea that since we don't own the assets, we can still use them. Um, the pay for what you use proficiency there is really the part that can drive that value even farther down, especially when you start considering um, the way that certain organizations need temporary expansion, which kind of leads us into the discussion of hybridization. You imagine a mm -hmm. scenario in which you have resources running in a data center, but you're concerned about periodic spikes in usage. Where are you going to get those resources? And is it possible for us to expand into a cloud service provider? So kind of wrapping this up here, thinking about hybrid computing, um, taking advantage of different combinations of this model is often going to be where one of the sweet spots are. Now, I don't know about you, Jeff. Do you have a different take on what hybrid cloud computing looks like or maybe some of the use cases you've seen for that? No, absolutely not. You are, you are dead on. In fact, uh, it reminds me of a story. I was actually working with a customer and their situation was that once a year during prom season, they sell party supplies and, and things like that. And during prom season was their busy season. And so we, before they were really comfortable, this is probably five, six, seven years ago, before they were comfortable with the cloud, any of us were, we were deploying on-premise equipment that was enough that it could handle the spiked workload, hmm. which, you know, any other time of the year, they're running that a whole Cisco environment, right? We deployed we deployed some top-notch Cisco <laughs> equipment to handle that busy workload, <laughs> and it's sitting there bored most of the year. <laughs> and so I love the idea of saying, you know what? Most of these applications are not going to cost much in the data center. This is a this is a shop that nine months out of the year needs a pretty small footprint in the data center, and so why not deploy that and allow it to to run all of the applications pretty cost effectively, but move that application that really spikes, you know, their ordering system, for example, get that up into the cloud so that number one, we can not worry too much if we lose internet on, on premise here, uh, you know, the people can't place orders, that would be a disaster. But on top of that, now we don't have to worry about those spiking workloads and we pay for what we use in the public cloud. And for the rest of the year, we're just happy running in our private data center. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Uh, you think about the DR opportunities there, you need to be able to fail over or the cloud bursting model that you were describing there where you have temporary needs. Um, in my consulting mm -hmm. experience, we typically look at the 70% range there. If you think you can use yeah. it 70% mm -hmm. of the year consistently, then you should probably buy the asset and keep it in house. But if you're looking at that awkward 30% scenario or less, um, or you don't even really know the numbers, <laughs> then you're really stuck in that yeah. situation where you need that that scalable, elastic resource. And hey, maybe later on you get the baseline knowledge that you need to go and inform those purchasing decisions later on. Um, one of the last things I kind of think, too, is uh, we just think about having a physical presence in different locations. If I'm experimenting with a new um, market, we're moving into EMEA and Europe, and we don't need mm -hmm. a full data center there yet, we can turn up services there, get a good round trip time, get a good low latency for some basic services there. And then as we begin expanding, we have more opportunity to kind of get the right patterns in place um, and understandings. You know, which kind of brings me down to the last concern is, do we have the skills to take advantage of these next generation tools and architectures? Because cloud service providers definitely offer us an opportunity there. And along those same lines, I think we can recognize that using AWS is not just like turning a switch on. We like to think it's that easy, but there's still a lot of expertise yes, that's do. involved with it. And I would imagine you could see managing hybrid infrastructure as needing additional skills and tools uh, along the way as well. Yeah, and ironically, these days, uh, there are some cloud people out there that might think that, hey, you know, it's actually easier to flip the switch on a data center because you all understand in the cloud world just how complicated the cloud can be. Yeah. And so now it's like, well, hey, it's just a matter of spinning up some servers and throwing a hypervisor on there. But as we know from, you know, back before the cloud, it's not that simple in the data center either. <laughs> and, and that's why I think about when, when you talk about new footprint in some locations, think about startups, right? I mean, startups 
taking advantage of the cloud to get going. You know, we same same use case, exact same use case there. We don't need a large footprint. We just need a small one. So let's spin up in the cloud. But at some point, we might find that the amount that we're spending per month makes sense for us to deploy a small private cloud into into a data center. And so this is this is an ongoing conversation. There's never a we're done with the cloud com- conversation, right? We're <laughs> we're always looking. How do we optimize? How do we make this more efficient? Every single application we deploy, an intentional decision should be made was whether that should go into the public cloud or the private cloud. And that is the hybrid cloud model. Oh, I love it. And of course, um, of course, for everybody out there who's learning and excited about a role in the mm. cloud computing world, I'll tell you, cloud computing is here, it's now, and it's affecting your career future right this minute. Um, and so just to kind of recap here, friends, today we talked about some of the deployment models that uh, the cloud computing world offers. Jeff gave us a great look at private computing, owning assets, running them in your own data centers, maintaining maximum levels of control over the data and the workloads that we're running or working in the land of unpredictability with cloud providers and taking advantage of that variable consumption, um, that on-demand compute model. And then of course, realizing that in the end, the smartest organizations, they're gonna hybridize. They're gonna be looking at ways to use all of these pieces. And that's exactly where uh, next generation cloud engineers like Jeff and myself come into play and probably you as well. So thanks again for joining Mm -hmm. us. And Jeff, I really appreciate you taking the time today, buddy. Hey, Bart, this has been a great conversation. Hopefully it's going to spark new conversations with another organization as well. So (laughs) thank you, Bart. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in the next video. See you in the cloud.